Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lyusha Rushkin. I was born and raised in Russia in a family with beekeepers. And uh, after getting educated in uh, uh, Moscow, Paris, or Indiana University and uh, University of Missouri, Columbia, getting a PhD in agroforestry and sustainable agriculture, I really felt it was time to retire and actually do something of the things that I was learning about in the uh, sustainable agriculture and sustainable beekeeping field. So we got the homestead 11 years ago in the Ozark Mountains, or a little in the middle of nowhere, uh, and I call it the Ozark Jungle because when it rains in the springtime, it really feels like Hawaii with all the water running through it, the mountains. So we, when we got this homestead, I really wanted to do two things, to grow watermelons, because coming from Russia, there was never enough growing days and enough sunshine to have a good watermelon crop, and to have uh, honey bees, because I was really missing the kind of unprocessed honey full of bee bread that I was enjoying back home in Russia. So I tried planting watermelons, <laughs> this was the first crop I brought in, and my daughter, who was uh, six at the time, said, Daddy, can I plant the seed too? I gave her a packet of seed, said, you can always try, and she tried. <laughs> so after that experience, I thought, okay, get the watermelons, let her do that, I will concentrate on the bees. And to the present day, Lada is in charge of growing vegetables uh, and running the garden for our family. And we should, when she is not in the garden, she is getting on uh, her uh, fox trotting horses and riding through the trails in the wilderness, checking the swamp traps that I have positioned there. So we were really much more successful in beekeeping uh, treatment free with the local wild stock than I was in growing watermelons. And the way it started is very simply putting out the swamp traps, the um, boxes, 40 liters or 10 gallons in volume on the trees uh, throughout the wilderness and the ozarks and catching local swarms. Uh, the uh, success rate for me catching swarms was about 50% per, uh, uh, per trap. So for every 10 traps you set out, five will have a swarm of pain. And we are talking about the wilderness swarms that have gone through the very rigorous selection for the bromides. So the kind of bees in terms of our, um, disease resistance we've been uh, getting is extraordinary. Uh, it uh, didn't take much time to go from zero hives to 40 hives without buying any bees, just working with the local bees available in the wilderness. So I would catch a swarm, I would put them in a horizontal hive that uh, I favor because it requires less management and no heavy lifting. Uh, and then the bees basically do the rest. There is very little disturbance in managing the horizontal hive the traditional way. When you just load it with frames in the springtime, the bees are built out the uh, home on their own, and then they go foraging, and you open it and they fall to harvest some honey. We have an amazing diversity of wildflowers where I live. They really have something going on and from the very early in the spring until the fall, starting with red buds and blackberry blossoms in the spring. My main honey crop comes from uh, winged sumac, which is an amazing plant. Uh, it's very good for our dry conditions because it can produce very good harvests of honey, uh, even when there is no rain for a month. Uh, another plant that I thought was tropical in origin, but it is native to the Midwest, button bush, uh, and gave that and many, many more plants that I do not have time to acknowledge here. And uh, uh, for me, it was as much about working with the bees as having a wonderful experience of being out in nature instead of sitting and working in a cubicle in a large city. And when you don't mess with the bees too much, they don't mess with you. My daughter was on the cover of our Acres USA magazine, and even though she's the daughter of a beekeeper and she's been helping me from since she was born, she hasn't been stung uh, and once in her life. And we keep it small scale, we keep it as a uh, family business. Uh, even with 45s, I don't even have a motorized extractor because we can, when you have children around, you don't really need one, they are the motor. Uh, when we have a, a crop of bee bread, we always also do uh, crush and strain. And I sell all my crop on the internet or on my website for $50 a pound, and I always sell out. Uh, out. 
just setting out their, the information there, explaining how this kind of honey produced in the wilderness away from the pesticide spray crops is uh, different from one you conventionally would get. I derived a lot of inspiration for my kind of beekeeping from the classical books on natural beekeeping, one written in Russian, keeping bees with a smile, and another in French, keeping bees in horizontal hives, like a comprehensive guide to apiculture. And for me, it's really as much about the smile as about anything else. For example, I never counted raw mice in my hives. I never drowned 300 bees in alcohol or soapy water to count mites. Uh, not because it's uh, not a useful technique to control the raw mice, but because A, I'm not going to treat anyway, and B, this is not fun. Uh, I don't enjoy chopping off heads of uh, the chickens that we have to eat, so I didn't want the keeping to become another chore that I don't particularly enjoy. So I have a very simple criterion of whether uh, I want to do something in beekeeping or not. Do I really enjoy it? If not, forget about it, I'll be doing something completely different. Another question I ask myself always, would I still be doing it if I didn't need to earn money this way? If the answer is yes, I would still be doing it there, then I'm on the right track. And I'm also deriving a lot of inspiration from the fact that I'm doing the kind of beekeeping that was a traditional for thousands of years. You go back to the books written 100 to 200 years ago, and you will see the image of beekeeping that was uh, as simple as putting bees in a box and not bothering them until harvest time. The book from 1835 written in Russian tells you that peasant families commonly, and I want to stress the word commonly, had a thousand hives, tending which required little effort. So the farmers could attend to other matters. And uh, if you do not trust this Russian author, especially today when we're being told that Russians are not always truthful, <laughs> You can go and read the classics of American uh, apiculture like Langstroth. You open his uh, famous The Hive and the Honey Bee, 1853, and you will see exactly the same thing, that uh, Russian and Polish beekeepers could number their colonies by the thousand. Here in America, when the European bees were brought, there was not even a need for beekeeping, so plentiful were the wild colonies all over the country. In Pennsylvania, there was so much honey in the woods, you could go and chop down a bee tree and get their honey, that there was no incentive of having bees of your own. The same in Illinois, where I live in Missouri, one person could locate 30 new bee trees in a week. Tom Seeley said it takes him a day and a half to locate a bee tree. Well, 200 years ago, you could find five new bee trees every day. And of course, even though they were harvesting them, cutting them down and destroying the bee nest to harvest honey, when you can chop down two trees a day, but you can find five new trees every day, the resource seems to be inexhaustible. Even when beekeeping started 100 years ago, in the wars of where I now have my bees, it was very low key. It was not movable frame hives, but just some gums, a piece of trunk with a stone on top, and bees were only visited at the time of harvest. And the historical sources say that five seasons out of six there was a harvest to be had from the bees. Today people will say that this kind of old style bee keeping is not uh, applicable anymore because of the boromites and other pests and disease issues that bee keepers and bees are facing. It's true and not true at the same time because no matter where you look in the wilderness, there are bees surviving and actually thriving treatment free uh, without any help from us and it's been my experience too. I've seen them even in the Yellowstone National Park in Montana with minus 30 degree winters. I certainly have seen lots and lots of bee trees in the Ozarks in southern Missouri. Not only that, but I've tracked many of these colonies for many, many years uh, in observation hives. This I call my BTV, and this is the only channel we watch at home, but it is free and it is on 24-7. And I would put a wild swarm in a box like this, sir, uh, 40 liters in size, or that would be comparable to what they would have in nature, and uh, connect it to the outside and see what they do in real time. And they would go, go year after year after year with no treatments of any kind. Uh, you would sometimes see the there, a wax moth, a small hive beetle, even deformed wing virus, 
but the colony just coexists with all these problems and carry it on. So at year five, there will still be a thriving colony in there, completely staying treatment free. And even when you look at them and look closely what they are programming, showing you on BTV, you realize that when bees evolve behavior like the one you see on the screen, the varroa mites don't really stand a chance. Would you agree? I would see this extensive grooming ongoing all the time with there are hundreds of groomers cleaning thoroughly their nest mates and there are these high stays we could clean and carry on for many many years without any involvement of my own. Not to say that we don't have any problems where I live, we have some really big issues uh, uh, related to beekeeping and they're the same as beekeepers experience all over the world even in Nepal where this picture was taken. So any guesses what is in common in terms of the challenges I face where I am and the bee hunters and honey hunters face in Nepal? Other than not falling from the extension ladder when you set out your swan traps. Well, I will show you the answer to this, and this is this, this is the picture of the ozarks I'm taking. The amount of deforestation that's happening right there, it is uh, mind-boggling. You would think that deforestation is only something you can find in the tropics or somewhere with, where they do clear cutting in the Pacific Northwest. No, where I live, that's exactly what's happening. And the forests are receding with such a speed that uh, in the 11 years that I've been there, we probably lost about half of the forest. People who've been there for 30 years, they uh, said that they saw the disappearance of another half. Uh, and uh, uh, this, of course, makes our wilderness beekeeping a fairly bleak prospect if you allow the wilderness that supports the bees to be gone forever and convert it to agriculture. And facing this challenge, just as Kirk Webster said two days ago, that looking at the challenge of keeping his bees uh, without treatments in the presence of Varroa made him realize that this challenge is a blessing in disguise because it shows you where our practices are not adapted and where we can improve. Actually facing this kind of picture for years in and year out and looking at all these bulldozers that are raising down the landscape uh, helped me realize that there is something intrinsically wrong with the model of the keeper we have and uh, nobody expressed it better than Schumark in his small and his beautiful book. He said the three functions of agriculture and by extension of agriculture or beekeeping would be in this order. To maintain man's connection to nature, as Kirk Webster said, to have the wonderful experience of working with living uh, beings and with the beauty of nature on a daily basis. Number two, making the land beautiful. And number three only is to produce what we need for life. It's not by accident that there is the word cult in the word either agriculture or agriculture. It's really a cult. It's a way of connecting to something bigger than yourself. And uh, surprisingly, in forestry and agriculture, there are many examples of people who were approaching forestry and agriculture with this mindset. First, you need to make sure it's just a good life experience for you. Then you make land beautiful, and then you do anything else you want to do on the land. In Missouri, we've had uh, uh, the largest landowner who acquired 160,000 acres of timberland, and he managed it sustainably to make the land more beautifully while deriving his own livelihood uh, at the same time. When he passed a few years ago at the age of 98, instead of leaving this uh, 160,000 acre uh, wilderness to his uh, family, he created a non-profit and invested it into a non-profit, so it will continue even after his death. There are of course many examples like that in agriculture too, where landscapes come first, but this is not what we see in beekeeping. It's not a recent problem. You go to the old books and they will tell you that a beekeeper's task is never complete for the linden forest that is there today may be gone tomorrow. And with your bees suddenly deprived of their main honey flow, you'll have to reinvent your beekeeping from scratch. So Seval Szymanowski from Ukraine was writing it more than 100 years ago. 
So what, what were really the keepers doing about this loss of heaven? Not much. We were learning from the bees. If the bee can again uh, forage from this flower because uh, there is some other bee visiting it or there is a predator, they'll just move on to another flower because there are plenty elsewhere. So as this habitat was gradually shrinking and being lost, beekeepers were just taking their bees elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere. And now just in a space of one generation or just you know, 10 or 15 years that I'm looking at the Bozarks, I see that we reach the end of the world and we have nowhere else to run. I can see it literally happening in real time on Google Maps and satellite photography. All these waves of, uh, the wave of uh, wild fields advancing and all this forest where I live and my bees live and where they come from is shrinking day by day. Even when I go on the bicycle ride, we have a 10 mile loop starting from my property. I cannot go on a bicycle ride once a month without seeing a new parcel of land devoid of trees. And I felt very depressed about it for a long time. Uh, because you know, if you do be keeping with this kind of awareness of the bees depending on the two mile radius around the hive for survival, it really hurts you seeing all this destruction. And it stopped being fun for me a few years ago and I felt like her giving up because it was not keeping bees with a smile but with keeping bees with pain. Not because of something I'm doing in my hives, but because there I see that the ecosystem they depend there upon is just leaving, uh, never to be seen again. And uh, I was looking for answers and eventually, fortunately, I found an answer in one famous book. You probably will not guess which book it is, but it was Winnie the Pooh, which I was reading to my children. And there is this wonderful statement there that Pooh felt that he ought to say something helpful about it, but he didn't quite know what. So he decided to do something helpful instead. So this is what I felt I need to be doing. Schumacher was saying that, you know, what is happening to the land today is really a reflection of our choices and our lifestyle. And if you need to do something about the destruction that you see happening, you need to re-examine your whole lifestyle first. We look at beekeeping and we tend to think about beekeeping as something that's very beneficial. We're being told that bees provide not only valuable food products, but also pollinate our crops that feed us. But in reality, if you think honestly about it, bees are pollinating all these huge industrial monocultures, actually helping to sustain the model of agriculture that's highly destructive. Even beekeeping itself, it requires all the same inputs as many other branches of agriculture. A hundred years ago, a beekeeping catalog would be two pages long, now it's 150 pages long and counting. You need the petroleum and treatments and sugar feeding and uh, plastic equipment and on and on and on. So you have all these inputs that require natural resources and then you have all these waste products. Your used uh, plastic frame certainly will not decompose anytime soon. And even if you consider the amount of lumber that goes into building the equipment, we're talking about millions of board feet every year. But even if you were to convert to some kind of low-key, all-time beekeeping using local materials to build your hives by hand or uh, with no table saws, do you think it would solve all the problems? Well, no, unfortunately. Uh, Schumacher said something that took me, even though I have a degree in economics, too. It took me 20 years to understand what he meant. Uh, and I think this calls a key, at least in my situation, to doing something helpful about the, the destruction I'm seeing around. He was saying, saving the land is not a question of what we can afford, but of what we choose to spend our money on. So imagine if you have a greener beekeeping operation. So you minimize the environmental impact uh, your operation has by using recycled materials, avoiding use of plastic, driving as little as possible from one acre to the next. But all the money that you are learning for your income in your household, you are still spending and it goes back into the economy that keeps destroying nature. So we keep going buying crap. And they use crap uh, not in an offensive way here, but as a scientific term uh, of <laughs> things that we do not really need. 
you can call it stuff instead. <laughs> and you know, it was the greatest mistake that environmentalists and all of us uh, had uh, ever since we started being concerned about the environment. We thought that when we buy $2,000 worth of uh, oak or hardwood flooring, we're just killing one or two or three trees, and uh, we can live with that. But in reality, we're killing 700 trees, and I will explain why. It's called in economics the opportunity cost. In the very direct way, unless you plow money back into conserving habitat, limiting the amount of money to buy stuff, uh, you are missing the opportunity to use the same amount of money for conserving the resource. With the average land values in the United States, one dollar, just one dollar, will buy you a plot of land six by six feet in size. One thousand dollars will buy you one acre of marginal land. This is certainly the value of land that we see where I live. As a society, just think about that. Americans spend $135 billion a year on dental services. So that means that if we're all willing to not see our dentist for a whole year, uh, we could buy an equivalent of 135 million acres per year to use in conservation. But, but for, you know, we cannot uh, hope that the whole society will suddenly become as aware as to give preference to saving nature compared to saving a smile. But if you look at your personal choices, whatever you want to do in your household, you will see that there is the same choice we are making every day with every dollar we spend. Every dollar or thousand dollars spent on something is, is the same money that could have been spent on saving the wilderness. So now when I look at any kind of expenditure in my household, I do not see dollars. I see trees and acres of trees that could be saved. I know that for every thousand dollars I could be saving 50 oak trees that are much older than me or even my parents. Uh, I am missing five uh, molars in my mouth and I was quoted $25,000 to fix that. And my wife says, Leo, you should do that because uh, people won't be listening to you if you <laughs> smile with a toothless grin. But for me, uh, spending $25,000 on dental services is 25 acres that I would be able to save. And on and on and on, you can make the list yourself, but realize that every dollar equals some conservation opportunity for each of us. Uh, uh, in uh, the U.S., you actually have just over four acres of rural land privately owned per person. Meaning that if all of us were putting aside one dollar per day over the course of your active or professional life of 30 years, there would be enough money in your household to buy your share of land and keep it from development or destruction. Uh, the net worth of Americans by the age of 70 is uh, $255,000. So if this money was not invested into savings account, but were rather invested into conservation, which can be productive. This land owner in the Ozarks who owned 160,000 acres, it was a thriving business enterprise at the same time. So this is what we decided we will do. We'll be, be plowing our money back into the landscapes that provide uh, habitat for our bees. And I said, I will not go over the number of eyes that I can have without conserving the sufficient number of acres for each colony. Uh, this I call the Sealy Acres because uh, I use the proceeds from the sale of um, Tom's book, The Lives of Bees, from my website to buy a completely pay for, for four acres of a large bee habitat where I live. And uh, more and more and more. So one year to the next, just buying more land where I am, we're now conserving more than 400 acres and uh, uh, half of it has already been completely paid for. And we add more every year. And I'm not doing it out of the sense of guilt. It's really fun. I'm having fun again with my bees. It's almost like playing in a board game and I want to win. And it also makes me feel more human. Uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said that to be human means to be responsible. And I very much feel this way. So I'm thankful for the bees of making me more responsible about uh, 
my beekeeping, including the landscapes they depend upon into my vision of what beekeeping is. And uh, to the point that my son once told me when he was little, he told me a creation story of how once upon a time the earth was square and the bees were living in the middle of the square earth, but because the earth was rotating, chunks of it were broken off and eventually became the sphere it is now, but the bees were still creating square homes, so they evolved some of them to become humans so that we can build them square boxes that they were used to when they first appeared. And they were foraging on distant planets like Mars and Venus and even Florida. So I heard this kind of story from my son many years ago, but now I came to feel the same way. I came to feel like I'm an extension of the bees and bees genotype. They cannot sell you a jar of their honey for $50 and put this money into conserving habitat for themselves, but I can do it for them. So I'm doing this on bees' behalf, and it feels awesome. I don't feel any embarrassment or being ashamed at selling my honey at $50 a pound or selling my Greedy Queens at $1,000 a piece because the bees are setting the price and all the money goes back to them rather than just supporting me. And many beekeepers actually had this vision before me. Uh, Ferdinand Lazudin, the author of this Keeping Bees with a Smile book, he was writing that the one thing you can do as a beekeeper to make a difference is to plant trees and secure that there will be trees for the future generations. The magnificent linden trees stand to this very day as a living reminder of the good people who planted them centuries ago. What else could serve as such a beautiful memory of a human being? Schumacher was saying the same thing. He was saying that just planting trees can provide almost everything that we humans need for life. Well, if I bought, next time you talk to me, 10,000 acres or a million acres, and by the way, there are private landowners, individuals in America who own 2 million acres uh, or more, do you think I will be happy to retire at that point of time? Well, the answer is no, because if you look at this book, kind of from the Earth, uh, recently published, and Kirk wrote a beautiful uh, introduction to it, there are some other challenges that I share with beekeepers around the world. Do you know what the greatest challenge for this community of honey hunters in India is? Pollen. The young generation doesn't want to continue what their parents are doing. Because I won't be here forever, and none of us would, this kind of long-term vision that I have is only feasible if my children or other children, somebody else, wants to carry on and continue doing it when I am gone, and it's a bigger challenge than one you th would think. Even my daughter Lada, who was uh, growing up on the farm, he once wanted to buy herself a $10 Barbie doll, and we were not buying her the $10 Barbie doll because she already had five, and then she remembered that when we were buying our land, she gave $100 of her own towards the land purchase. So she said, can we sell everything so I can have my hundred dollars back to buy the Barbie doll? And thought, gosh, after I'm gone, everything will be solved so that my <laughs> grandchildren can have Barbie dolls. But no, you know, fortunately I'm seeing that after all these years, when we were buying the most recent uh, hundred acres of land, Lada gave me a check for a thousand dollars that she earned herself in our big business to contribute to the land purchase. So I'm, I'm, now I have hope. And I, even I'm standing here, I'm comforted knowing that instead of bulldozers, there is now buzzing of our bees on the land that I'm helping protect, 400 acres of Aussie wilderness, and is going back into the wild state that there are hundreds upon hundreds of 200-year-old oaks that takes two persons to hug that are there because of my help. And the next spring it will be like that, and there will be wild strawberries for children to eat, and one day my son told me, Daddy, when you die, you won't be able to care for your bees or for your trees. But this is okay, because I will care, care for them for you. I swallowed tears and I said to him, thank you very much. And I hope this will come to pass. Because, you know, it's not the bees that really need our help. The bees are doing fine. They will figure out Varoma, small fabulous, anything. 
they cannot really figure out the loss of habitat on their own. And by helping bees cope with this biggest challenge and making sure that it will last, we are also saving ourselves. If you'd like to learn more about that, uh, I invite you to read Keeping Bees with a Smile or Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hive by Lance, which had the same kind of long term vision based on habitat restoration and conservation. I also teach courses, two day courses in natural beekeeping at my farm. There is one in October. I'm also at the invitation of Bees and Develop for development in Wales and the United Kingdom in the first weekend of October. You can come and attend it two-day course there, and more information on my website, horizontalhive.com. Thank you. I've seen over and over again that conservation easements can be overturned as long as you have a good, talented lawyer. So it's not as permanent as having it, in my vision, as a privately owned uh, pollinate and honeybee reserve. So that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you.